We are in the midst of the greatest economic breakdown crisis civilization has ever known. To lead the United States out of this crisis, we have supposedly been offered only two options for president, one crazier than the other, and both unfit for the job. Lyndon LaRouche has warned of this crisis repeatedly for decades. This occurs at a time where the world monetary financial system is actually now currently in the process of disintegrating. He recently promoted a strategy the United States government could adopt to stop the world's rapid descent into a new dark age. Based on the best aspects of the United States history, of Lincoln and FDR, but it has fallen on deaf ears. No policymaker and neither of the two supposed candidates for president has addressed what LaRouche has offered, despite massive support on the local and state level. Are these officials stupid, suicidal, or perhaps miseducated? To begin, let us ask a most pertinent question. What is the Harvard Yard? This is the story behind the murder of the American intellectual tradition. Perhaps it is buried at Harvard University. Harvard is in typical, well, it's a, I've lived in that vicinity knew a lot of Harvard contacts, and some of them were actually quite intelligent in those days. I, I would despair of finding that kind of intelligence that I saw 40, 50 years ago in that area anymore. The real mission of the United States, as stated in the preamble of the Constitution, is the development of the individual and the improvement of life for all. In other words, the defense of the general welfare. From its inception, its universities were meant to promote the truth and thus to be the first line of defense against the British Empire's degraded view of man. Now this, of course, was our tradition. It has been our tradition up to a very recent time. Look at our universities of what became our university is beginning with Harvard University, which at one time was a great university, the first and more important one on North America, but uh, it had bad times too. Harvard's history in relation to this mission is a tangled web woven across the decades preceding the Revolutionary War until the present day. When Harvard, the first college of the colonies, was founded, and came under the leadership of Increase Mather as its president, it was a great defender of what is rightly called the American intellectual tradition, which generated the conceptions of our country's founding documents. But Mather was displaced, as was the curriculum he advocated, and the university came to serve a mixed purpose during the revolution itself, often acting as a hub for British and Tory actions against the patriots, despite the number of revolutionary leaders who stepped forth from its brick buildings. We had other universities were started. We had some of the greatest science in the world uh, was practiced here. For example, Benjamin Franklin was actually a leading scientist of the world in his lifetime. His great-grandson, Alexander Dallas Bates, is typical in the 19th century of the continuity of that. It was from the United States that the greatest transformation of European civilization occurred in the late 19th century. Our victory over the British Confederacy inspired Europe, including the case of Bismarck, the case of Russia, these things. We were a source of it. 
In the early 1800s, Harvard became the epicenter for the treason faction, the brazenly British allied perpetrators of multiple attempts to destroy the United States as a nation. Through the promotion of internal unrest or even civil war, this faction enthusiastically vied for a role as imperial junior partner to the British Empire run by the British East India Company. All through this point, the empire interest in Europe especially the British or the Anglo-Dutch liberal interest, has always been determined to destroy us. Not because we were people, but because we represented a threat to the empire. Our republican system, our sovereign nation-state, and our devotion to science and culture. Well, the British said, corrupt them, destroy them, do everything possible to corrupt this thing. And they tried to destroy us with, the, with slavery. It didn't work. Then they said, we're going to destroy the whole world to get rid of this American influence, which threatens the empire. And that's not the British people. They certainly don't get much benefit out of this process. But it's from this Anglo-Dutch oligarchy, which continues this oligarchical tradition. They hate science. They hate the idea that ordinary people will have a scientific education. That the ordinary people will have a classical cultural civilization. At moments, great leaders... Fighters for humanity have graduated from Harvard. But, unfortunately, Harvard has more often produced pestilential harbingers of mankind's doom. Even in my lifetime, which is extended somewhat, from the time I returned from war to the present, there has been a progressive degeneration of the culture and of the universities of the United States. I complained about them when I was young, returning from the war. I always fought this educational system. In the latter half of the 20th century, Harvard outdid itself in graduating gutless men and women, some truly evil, who would go on to hold leading positions in our government as well as within the governments of foreign nations. Through its crooked history, Harvard has, at key moments, been a tool of the good, having once chosen to champion the American system against empire. However, it has been consciously deployed to destroy the patriotic tradition and mission of the United States. The influence of H.G. Wells inside the prestigious institutions of our country, such as the case of former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, who professed herself to be a loyal member of the H.G. Wells Society, typifies the manner in which British intelligence has acted to subvert our republic by taking over our institutions and making the defenders of the inalienable rights of man into accomplices in their eradication. But what I see is no longer a corrupted educational system. I see now a cult, an evil cult, <clears throat> which has no interest. We have no industry anymore. We don't have scientists anymore. We have just a few of them. We couldn't staff the projects that we were staffing 20 years ago. We don't have the people. We don't have the brains anymore. So therefore, the problem is the universities have become instruments of our intellectual destruction when they should have been, as they were set up to be in large part. Uh, typical the American, we were to, to develop our capabilities for changing the world for the benefit of the world as a whole, not to create an empire. That's the problem. Why did we allow our premier intellectual defense to become a tool of our enemies?
The idea of controlling a society by controlling the curricula at a handful of its leading universities, which then set the standard for all institutions, is not new. The precedent for this was the Royal Society's creation of the synthetic personality of Isaac Newton. If you take any physics class or mathematics class today in the universities, you'll run into sections which are attributed to the great genius of Newton. Nobody leaves these classes knowing anything about uh, who Newton was or who Kepler was or who um, Einstein was or who any of these guys were. You just leave with a bunch of mathematical garbage in your head thinking, well, Newton must be the greatest mathematician in the universe ever. It is still questionable whether Isaac Newton was a real person. What is not up for debate is that his associates attempted to plagiarize the results of Johannes Kepler's discovery of universal gravitation and then packaged this crude act of plagiarism in a book with Newton's name on the cover. Absolutely no evidence was given in the book that Newton had discovered anything at all. He's not even capable of expressing in a clear way the philosophical views that he's credited with. All the places where you have an explicit discussion of the, the details and the logical consequences of so-called Newtonian philosophy are written by other people. A student reading the published works of Johannes Kepler can follow step by step how Kepler thought as he hypothesized the organizing principles of the solar system. However, the associates of Newton selected those few results from Kepler that could be written as neat mathematical formulas and then arranged them as logical derivations from a few initial axioms. What is the gravitational force? If this is an object, capital M, and you can think of this as being the Earth if you want to, and there is here an object, little m, then I have to know what the forces are between the two. And this now is, the, is Newton's universal law of gravity, which he postulated. Universal law of gravity. He says the force that little m experiences, this force equals, I'll put a little m here and a capital M here, so it is little m experiences that force due to the presence of capital M equals little m times capital M times a constant, which Newton in his days didn't know yet what that value was, divided by r squared, if r is the distance between the two. Read the letters of Newton's contemporary John Flamsteed. Flamsteed is a, a real scientist in the model of Kepler, and he is interested about the inverse square law. And he's had some discussions with Newton about it, and he points out the people who become, you know, who just wet their pants over it. The, what, what, the mo what modern professors do, the people who did that in Newton's time were all the people who hung around the court, not the scientists, were all these fluffy people who were around kissing ass trying to get in good with some prince or some lord or somebody with position. They went crazy over Newton's ideas. The actual, the actual astronomers could do nothing with it. The Principia had no effect on observational astronomy. In reality, Newton's infamous inverse square law can be easily derived from Kepler's principles and other principles well known by the late 17th century. In 1618, Kepler discovered his so-called harmonic, sesquialterate law which states that the ratio of two individual planets' years squared is always equal to the ratio of those two planets' mean distances from the Sun cubed. This principle, which yokes all planets to the same system, can be stated in another way. The ratio of any planet's mean distance from the Sun cubed to its orbital period squared is the same for all planets in the solar system. Later, Christian Huygens, a follower of Kepler, discovered the principles of infinitesimal changes in rotational velocity, which he called centripetal acceleration. 
Newton's handlers simply plagiarized these two discoveries as math formulas and derived Newton's inverse square force law from them. in Newton. The so-called consequences of his work, this idea of the belief in an absolute space, the belief in an absolute time, the belief in action at a distance through gravitation, what's represented mathematically in his inverse square laws, all stem from a form of religious belief that he tried to cover up with his, his adage, the uh, I don't make hypotheses. <laughs> What it really meant was, I don't want to talk about my hypotheses because they're crazy as hell. <laughs> the calculus was actually developed by the intellectual inspiration of the United States, Gottfried Leibniz. The evidence that Newton had independently created the calculus was supposedly tucked away in a trunk of papers which he had produced while a student at Trinity College. The contents of this trunk were to have vindicated Newton once and for all, to reveal his true genius for all the world to see. John Maynard Keynes, a bad economist and Newton worshipper, was able to purchase this trunk in the 1930s, and he delivered a lecture in the 1940s after investigating its contents. So he bought this trunk thinking that finally the all the work going into the calculus by Newton will finally will, we found it. It's in here. So he opens the trunk up, he actually gives numbers of pages, he says, I found 100,000 pages of work on pure alchemy, alchemy and, and black magic. Actually, he calls it Babylonian magic. He says there's thousands of pages on, on biblical revelation, on biblical prophecy, nothing on calculus. There's absolutely nothing on science in the trunk. And these were all of, the, all of his notes and so forth that he was taking uh, at Trinity University. So the question... Is, was raised in my mind, well, if this was everything that Newton was doing in his spare time, where is the science? The real Isaac Newton was not a scientist, but a Babylonian witch. The Newton myth was constructed in order to convince people that the universe were essentially unknowable, except to the high priests, who discover universal principles through a sort of divine revelation. The myth of Newton the scientist was propagated throughout Europe and into the American colonies in order to pollute the minds of all potential revolutionaries and crush the beginnings of the American intellectual tradition. You now realize that we are educated to be dummies because they want to make slaves of us. And the, and the principle is explained nicely by Aeschylus in Prometheus Bound. There is a principle which he refers to as fire for the purposes of the drama. The principle which we would sometimes call energy flux density, but you can give another term to it, better term to it. It's actually going to a higher order of thinking. And a higher order of thinking in these terms as principle means that you go to, to a more efficient process and you are getting something which from the standpoint of the teacher of uh, thermodynamics would say is impossible. You actually get something in terms of thermodynamic ter terms you get something for nothing if you do it well. In the foreword to the Principia, a foreword which is written without Newton's knowledge, without Newton, this is something that was put together by Coates and Samuel Clark, two of Newton's controllers. And in that, you have, you can see what the actual philosophical, political intention of introducing this philosophy was, which was as an attack against the idea that there's something unique about the creative capabilities that exist in every human individual. An attack on the idea that human beings as a species, as a whole, each and every one of us, 
have the capacity to understand how the universe was created. They wanted to attack that idea of knowability and introduce an oligarchical idea that you have a handful of people who've got direct access to special knowledge through some sort of revelation, and they govern things, and the rest of you are peasants who should shut up. And that's a consequence of, of Newton's philosophical outlook. Like the first law, the second law only holds in inertial reference frames. Can the first law, the second law be proven? No. Do we believe in it? Yes. Why do we believe in it? Because all experiments and all measurements within the uncertainty of the measurements are in agreement with the second law. Now you may object and you may say, this is strange what you've been doing. It's really presented as a fraud that, okay, well, Newton is freed science from all these metaphysical speculations. Newton has finally rid science of superstition, which was what came prior, uh, Kepler superstition, etc. But it's not true. Newton, his entire philosophical outlook is premised upon a completely occult, completely superstitious, completely unknowable theological <laughs> belief. Harvard was intended to be a defender of true revolutionary creativity in these United States of America against the psychological warfare waged by the British. Unfortunately, this is no longer the case. Today's academics believe that mathematical formulations have the power to shape physical reality. For example, Harvard astronomy professor Owen Gingrich, who is known as the international authority on Johannes Kepler, recently gave an interview where he revealed what he really thinks. The mathematics show that in this kind of model, there's no reason why you can't change the parameters and have other, quite different universes. And if you can show mathematically that they can be there, there's nothing to prevent them from actually being there. I think many people have a problem with that because it is hopeless to get in touch with any of these other universes. But I always have to pause and say, for a long time, Christians have been talking about a totally other universe that we don't have direct access to. And that's heaven, the hereafter, paradise, whatever. That's, that's the expert of Kepler at Harvard. If you're one of the top professors at Harvard, you're known as the expert in your subject. You're the one that sets the standard for what's taught in the rest of the universities of the United States and for a large part around the world also because it's seen as our top university. Owen Gingrich and his ilk believe in the power of mathematical incantations which conjure fearsome chimeras such as alternate universes. When organizers with the LaRouche Political Action Committee tried to discuss their work on Kepler with Gingrich, this Harvard professor claimed that scientific truth was less important to him than scientific consensus. For him, the validity of a hypothesis depends not on physical evidence, but on agreement between enough scientific gossipers. This mechanism of consensus is used today by the same oligarchical networks that used Newton to attempt to halt the spread of the creative ideas of scientists like Leibniz and Kepler. One of the mantras in, in uh, faculties around academia and so forth is publish or perish. Right? You've got to publish your works or else you're just going to fizzle out and you're not going to make it anywhere. So you publish a bunch and then you'll be promoted, you'll get to go places, and you'll start to be put in the Scientific American and Discover Magazine and Nature Magazine and so forth. The issue is that in order to get published, your paper has to go before the peer review. Who knows how they're selected? Supposedly it's a democratic process, but it's more of a um, process of selecting priests for uh, some type of a witch's coven or something like that. These priests look at your paper and, once again, make sure that you're not saying anything that's going to challenge the ideas that are appropriate for a slave society. The modern university performs two functions. One is to manufacture debt slaves, who today owe upwards of $350 billion. 
Harvard, for example, is estimated to cost about $50,000 a year for an undergraduate. Therefore, the average cost of a degree from Harvard is $200,000. A degree is supposed to be the student's path to financial and social success later in life. But since the world economic system is dead, that is currently an impossible goal. Nonetheless, we are told that future employability and social opportunities are directly proportional to the debt accrued through education. Thus, the student is trapped and willingly submits to a process that ultimately imprisons his mind. This is how the university achieves its second, more insidious function, to monitor and control which ideas are accepted by society, to act as an intelligence operation. At each level of education, the method of instruction and the requirements for advancement are designed to prevent the average person from making creative breakthroughs. You know, a kid graduates from college as an undergraduate, gets his BS degree, and decides that he wants to go on for higher education. And let's assume that this student is actually excited about ideas, wants to make discoveries, and was somewhat excitable by what he learned as an undergraduate, regardless of the fact that most of it was bunk, but he's excited about the idea of learning new ideas. Gets to graduate school, and finds very quickly that what he's learning is not how to make new discoveries, but how to transform what are actual discoveries into derivations from already known uh, axioms and postulates and definitions and so forth. So the totality of this uh, poor, potentially creative kid's life in a graduate school is learning how to take real discoveries and destroy them. What price is too high to pay for a degree? Around the 2000 presidential election, many young people began to realize they were a no-future generation. A number of them took an interest in the LaRouche campaign's intervention into the insane presidential election. They realized that the questions of policy and politics were really epistemological questions that their prior educations had not prepared them to answer. In fact, they found that those who had experience with the modern university system had to overcome its crippling effects on their ability to think. It became clear after coming around, especially after trying to read a single paper by Lyndon LaRouche, that the education that we've been given, that we were getting on the universities, was not adequate to discuss basic, the, discuss basic topics that are necessary to further human society, basic topics for economics. As he goes through this entire historical scientific arc that's required to make the point he's trying to make, you realize that that's just a void for the majority of our generation, no matter how, uh, what quality of education you thought you were receiving. These young people were confronted with the realization that their schooling wasn't merely inadequate, but that it had been fundamentally unsound. They saw that the degrees for which they had borrowed thousands of dollars and for which their peers continued to borrow, were merely emblems of a person's willingness to submit to standard doctrine. They saw that the modern university system is a racket, that higher education does not wish to create seekers after truth, but to kill the truth, whether in the sciences, where the claim of empirical veracity and mathematical rigor masks what amounts to occult belief, or in the humanities, where a department like cultural anthropology could exist when the main idea from the department was that there is no truth. I actually shopped a sociology class, Soch 1, 
And the first day of class, the professor's main point was to try to you know, disabuse anyone in his class who believed that anything was knowable by having them try to come up with examples of things that were true, and he would somehow try to say that they were actually just a societal norm. So it's a little bit beyond me why anyone would want to pay someone to teach them who maintains that there is no truth. With only the barest minimum on which to rely from their former educations, these young people found themselves in a challenging situation. Well, so we are stuck having to build an educational process up from scratch. And you don't realize you've got all these artifacts left over for, from how you thought about things like history, the way it was promoted in elementary school, high school, to university. For example, let's take all the people who believe in Euclidean geometry and who carry that belief in some form or other into present time. Because of that belief, which they had to adhere to to get their degree, they have a factor of incompetence. I lack that incompetence. So, relying on LaRouche's insight, they began to uncover what their formal educations had buried. The model for how to understand, how to know that something is true when you see it, is Plato, is in the, is in the Plato dialogues. So that became a, an absolutely crucial part of the development of the youth movement, was having these Plato readings on Sunday, where you're really working through not the facts of the dialogue. You're not trying to get some conclusion of the dialogue. If you wanted a conclusion, he would have written a treatise. You would have had the, the treatises of Plato. But instead, you've got the Platonic dialogues, because what you want to learn is the process of reaching truth, of attaining something that's true. And really, the most important part of that is the process of sifting through bullshit. <laughs> How do you decide what you're going to throw out and what you're not going to keep? And if you do that enough, you'll start to zero in on what it is you want to keep. A real education is based on re-experiencing the acts of discovery of the greatest thinkers, rather than learning rules or formulas. Young researchers with the LaRouche Pack worked for years to uncover the true inner history of science. Going through their findings at classes and weekend seminars, they became the living center of the American intellectual tradition and came to embody what universities ought to be. After a period of youthful intellectual investigation, LaRouche defined a narrow path, stressing the need to have a coherent comprehension of the internal development of science. Starting from the Pythagoreans, through Kepler's discovery of universal gravitation, Gauss's discovery of the orbit of the asteroid series, culminating with Riemann's investigation of physical hypergeometries. And so these young people set off, beginning with Johannes Kepler's major works, aided by websites, translations, animations, and documents produced by small advanced research teams. The first in-depth work was on Kepler's two major books, The New Astronomy and The Harmony of the World, where Kepler elaborates his discovery of universal gravitation thus creating modern scientific practice. His unanswered questions provoked the future discoveries of such scientists as Leibniz, in the case of the physical integral calculus, and Gauss, on the subject of elliptical functions. This website is the most thorough pedagogical material ever made for understanding Kepler's works, was linked to by NASA's website. You know, as we were proceeding in doing this, all of a sudden here comes this mannequin of a website called keplersdiscovery.com, which attempts to do exactly what we did. But it's really a farce, it's a plagiarism, and it's, it's wrong. A lot of the, the, the animations and the things they go through are just wrong. This website was an obvious fraud. Every image on it specifically related to Kepler's works was copied from the WLYM.com website.
the copy was not even competent. Their complete lack of understanding shone through. Kepler wrote the new astronomy on a subject which was a serious field of debate between the systems of Ptolemy, who puts the Earth at the center, Copernicus, who as everyone's familiar, puts the Sun at the center, almost, and another man not so familiar today named Tycho Brahe, who had the planets moving about the Sun and the Sun moving about the body of the Earth. Now, Kepler was a Copernican, but he does not begin the new astronomy by laying out reasons why Copernicus's system was geometrically superior. Instead, he proves that all three of them can have their parameters adjusted to be completely geometrically equivalent, meaning that as they were understood up to his day, there would be no observation you could ever make that would determine which of the three was correct. The way the WLYM.com website explains that is to make actually identical geometric motions in the Ptolemaic, Copernican, and Tycho Brahe forms. They're then laid side by side to demonstrate that the motion is equivalent. And there's an interactive animation as well where you can move between the three to get a real sense in your mind of the geometrical equivalence between them. Kepler's discovery.com really screwed this one up. This is one of their, their, their biggest mistakes. Every one of the three systems is an error. The Ptolemaic system lacks the sun, which is important because that dictates how the epicycle is rotated. The Copernican system, they put a double epicycle on here, which makes the eccentricity completely unequivalent to the Ptolemaic one. And the Tycho Brahe one, they made a mistake that even a typical Wikipedia contributor probably would not have made, which is that they made Mars's orbit smaller than the orbit of the sun around the Earth. Amazing incompetence. Then in no way do they, somehow, do they address the fact that they're actually equivalent, but they simply write after showing these three incompetent animations that Kepler showed that they were equivalent within a hair's breadth. A perfect example of stating something without forcing belief through an actual demonstration that creates knowledge in the mind of someone working through the website. If you didn't already believe that on your own, there'd be nothing compelling whatsoever in the website to make a case for that. The trouble of finding out where a planet is located is that the Earth's motion also affects where the planet appears to be. So at certain times when the Earth, Sun, and, and the planet, such as Mars, are all in the line, you're able to observe Mars and it's in the same position as the Sun would have seen it. These observations were known as oppositions. Now if you have enough of these, you can start to piece together what the orbit looks like from the Sun's point of view. Kepler's predecessors, when doing this, all realized that the planet's speeds increase and decrease, not just from the standpoint of us on a moving Earth, but also that the planets actually do change their speeds. The way they had all explain this is through the use of what they call an equant, which is a, an imaginary point, a geometrical point, nothing exists there, but around this point the planets move at a constant angular speed. Since the point isn't at the center of the orbit, it means that the planets actually speed up and slow down according to this equant. So what Kepler did was he made a model that he called his vicarious hypothesis. He called it vicarious because he didn't believe that a geometric point actually caused motion. He believed that the sun was the cause of the motion of the planets. But in order to open people's minds up to that possibility, he had to show why all of his predecessors were necessarily wrong. So what he did was he made a model with their method, but doing a better job than any of them had. One of the key steps in doing this was to not make a geometric assumption that his predecessors had made. For example, Copernicus said that you have the Sun, you have the center of Mars's orbit, and you have the equant. They're all on a line, and the center of Mars's orbit must lie directly between the Sun and the equant. If you make that assumption, three measurements made at opposition are enough to determine the parameters of the orbit and make a model. Kepler did not make that assumption. He assumed that the center of Mars's orbit could lie anywhere on the line between the Sun and the equant. And therefore, to determine a specific model, he had to use four observations instead of three. And it made for a lot more work. He basically had to adjust the parameters until the model fit as exactly as it could. It was an incredible success. With his model, he was correct within observational accuracy for all of the observations of Mars. However, 
it incorporated a distance between the Sun and the center of Mars's orbit that was not in accord with actual measurements of Mars's distance from the Sun. When he made that correction, then the the model no longer accurately predicted where Mars would be. So what the, the fact that this error was inescapable meant not that Kepler hadn't done a good enough job making his model, but that the method for making the model was itself fundamentally flawed. This creates an actual sensation in the mind of, this, of the idea and the foundations of astronomy actually themselves being wrong and forces the reader of this book to, con- to be open to the idea of something else causing the motions. This opened the way to an astronomy based on causes, a physical astronomy, a new astronomy. On their web page, they had to explain why Kepler used four observations to make his vicarious hypothesis. They say that he used three observations, because three points make a circle, and they used a fourth for good measure. This plagiarism was politically motivated. It was perpetrated for the same reasons that Newton was created. This fraud could only be accepted because modern education simply passes stories down from teacher to student. When we learned the Pythagorean theorem, um, I remember that one girl in the class had raised her hand and asked the teacher how he knew it was true. And his response was that that's what he had learned in school. I think that that seems to continue. The education system, the, the academic education system, has a lot to defend. They're probably terrified of what we're doing because it really shakes the very foundations on which you know, every single university education system is, is structured upon, which is this empirical method. It's, it's radical empir- empiricism, uh, logical positivism. Kepler breaks the back of all of that. And I think they're probably terrified of that. Kepler had always known that the universe was harmonic because it was knowable to the mind of man. God, like one of our own architects, approached the task of constructing the universe with order and pattern and laid out the individual parts accordingly, as if it were not art which imitated nature, but God himself had looked to the mode of building of man who was to be. From the publication of the Mysterium Cosmographicum when he was 25 years old, until the end of his life, this idea guided him. He recognized that he was continuing on the path of the Pythagoreans, completing what they had left unfinished. He knew that they had conceived the sun to be at the center of the solar system, and supposed that they had also shared his hypothesis that the relationships between the nested platonic solids determined the distances of the planets from one another. He really never gave up on this idea of the interposition of the solids in the planetary system. Although he advanced upon it, he still held on to the idea that this was a necessary part in the development of the orbits of the solar system. He also had a number of other hypotheses about the, the organization of the solar system at that time before the, getting the advanced data. When Kepler got Tycho Brahe's data for the observations of Mars, he was able to discover the organizing principles for a single orbit. He first hypothesized that each planet, including the Earth, traverses its path according to equal areas swept out in equal times. He then considered the true cause of the planet's motions towards and away from the Sun, and determined that an elliptical orbit would satisfy the physical conditions. With the problem of the single orbit solved, entirely new questions were raised. But this still didn't answer the question of why the particular ellipses had the eccentricities that they did. Out of an array of an infinite amount of elliptical orbits that could possibly exist in the solar system, there was only particular cases that actually did exist. So why was that the case? In seeking to solve the unanswered questions about the planet's motions, 
including the cause of their eccentricities, Kepler left the domain of visible space and explored the domain of audible space, the realm of music, which the Pythagoreans thought of as the underlying fabric of the universe. He first examines and does an exhaustive examination of the boundaries of visual space, of geometry, that is, plane geometry. He does the same thing with solid geometry, then extends that into the musical domain, extends that into the auditory domain, and examines all these characteristics of space he then takes you from the standpoint of an observer on the sun and actually constructs the entire solar system based upon those principles. He conceived of the sun as a composer, the generator of the harmonic relations among the planets, and thus sought for the harmonic proportions in the fastest and slowest angular velocities of each planet as seen from the Sun. For example, on the day Mars is closest to the Sun at perihelion, it would appear to traverse a 38-minute arc in the sky. On the day it is farthest from the Sun at aphelion, it would appear to traverse a 26-minute arc in the sky. The ratio between these is almost the ratio 2 to 3. When a vibrating string is divided into thirds, and two-thirds of it is plucked, it makes the harmonic interval of a fifth with the whole string. Kepler found each pair of planetary extreme motions corresponds to a different harmonic interval. And this is what Kepler finds at the very, towards the end of his life, that the reason for the eccentricities being the way that they are was so that an observer on the sun could actually discover that the entire solar system was arranged in such a way that both the major and minor mode in music, the, that is, the major and minor modes that we find in classical composition are expressed through the eccentricities of the orbits, through the motions of the planets at the extremes of their orbits, at their apsides, uh, at their perihelion and aphelion. While the eye perceived that the proportions of visible space were analogous to the distances of the planets from each other, the ear perceived that the relationships of audible space were analogous to the speeds of the planets. The mind then had to conceive of the juxtaposition of these two senses, of sight and hearing, to perceive the relations among the speeds and distances of all the planets together. This was Kepler's discovery, the culmination of his life's work. He discovered gravitation as the harmonic, 
unifying principle underlying the relations among all the bodies in the universe, just as a musical idea unifies multiple voices, singing seemingly radically differing lines in a complex polyphonic choral piece to a single effect. Although Kepler was willing to discard any of his assumptions, the one thing he held on to was that the Creator's universe is knowable to the mind of man. The student studying Kepler can't help but be inspired. Kepler's work throughout the course of his life had been a continuous development of what was his idea of man's place in the universe. That he started with the bold assumption that mankind was able to discover principles that were utilized by the creator in the act of creating the universe. And that based upon this ability of discovering these principles, we could then employ similar principles to better the society, better the living conditions of those around us and into the future. As our founding fathers knew, people who are inspired by the power of their own minds will not allow themselves to be enslaved. Thus, the brutish empire spared no effort in their attempt to wipe out the significance of Kepler and his intellectual followers. Before I joined the LaRouche movement, in one of my math classes in college, when I was deciding to go to graduate school, one of my teachers, in answer to a question of how did Gauss make his discoveries, the professor said, oh, well, you can't know that. Nobody knows how Gauss made his discoveries. It looks like he already had the idea in his head. Nobody knows what he was thinking. So we just have all these formulas that we have to play with. So after I joined the movement, I started to look into Gauss, and his mind is indeed knowable. What's said today about his discovery of the orbit of Ceres, which was a discovery that just took Europe by storm because nobody could figure out this orbit. Gauss came out of the blue. He was this young 20-something kid who just trumped all the astronomers of Europe and showed that the, essentially their methods weren't working, and his was. What's said today in explanation, because the question is still exists, how did Gauss discover the orbit of Ceres? What's said today is that he used his method of least squares, which is a method of reducing errors. What we found is that this explanation is bunk. It's a cowardly explanation. It's an explanation by a priesthood who's afraid of people understanding how Gauss really thought, which is not Newtonian. It's anti-Euclidean. It's Keplerian. How Gauss really discovered the orbit of Ceres is the same way that Kepler discovered how the entire solar system functions. Gauss used the method of harmonics to discover Ceres. Are the claims we are making here esoteric knowledge? Secrets hidden where they can't be found? How would a curious student independently verify our claims? It's all available online. If, if people were serious... Is part of the problem now is just there's no serious research done on anything. The assumption is that everything you need to know exists somewhere in a textbook. The official line, well, it wouldn't have made it this far as the official line if it wasn't true, would it? I mean, everybody wouldn't say it if it weren't true, would they? Every biography I've ever read said this. That must make it true, mustn't it? All my professors say this is the case. All my professors say Newton is a genius. That must make it true. I mean, a quick look at, look at Newton's contemporaries. 
And all that's available. All that exists. All the quotes are there. All again, most of it. Uh, 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 <laughs> I wouldn't suggest people look online for most things. But much of it exists online, in digitized format, the original sources that people can read for themselves. We are each given only one life. Why would we waste it on fairy tales about sorcerers when the real universe is so much more interesting and our minds so potentially powerful? Why would a person who prided himself on his intelligence allow our society to disintegrate, allow our civilization to be imperiled, allow the tragedy of the current moment to unfold before his eyes. The professors today are exactly like the courtiers in Newton's time. They exist not for the promotion of scientific truth, they exist to jockey for position. They're trying to get in good with an establishment. They're trying to kiss ass. They recognize that their position depends on them towing this line. So why would you, why, why would they want to look up the actual facts of the matter and discuss that? Wouldn't that just make their life more difficult? Same thing, most students, most students of science. It wouldn't be hard for them to look up the evidence that we've presented on Newton's case. They don't want to because it would make their life more difficult. To have to consider that to have to consider that would mean that they'd have to talk about that. To have to talk about that would mean that they'd face the repercussions of talking about that. And the repercussions mean they lose their job, they lose this and that. It's a, it's a, a fear of the establishment which has a greater hold on them than any love of truth. And because of that, they're not scientists and never will be. What would happen if the pagan worshippers of Isaac Newton were cured? Powerful institutions, such as the British Empire in particular, would disintegrate for loss of self-confidence if the truth concerning the facts of capitalist discovery were generally acknowledged among academics and related professionals. Or to put the point in another way, religious faith in that Olympian Zeus, who is the putative father of all European imperialism, would evaporate. The high priests of Babylon would fall, and the entire system of belief associated with the British system and its antecedents would crumble forever, as if before one's eyes. It's a, a fear of the establishment which has a greater hold on them than any love of truth. And because of that, they're not scientists and never will be. Well, one of the things that we've been able to reveal is the real nature of the Harvard Yard. It's only two inches.
the universe is inherently creative. And we have got to catch up with the culture.